All right, hello everybody. I'm Brandon with Pacific Flow Control, one of the hot tapping companies in town here. Super excited to be here with you guys. This is actually a brand new presentation for me. Just finished putting it together, probably about two hours ago. But um, today we're gonna go over engineered hot taps and everything you didn't know you could hot tap. Um, it's gonna be a pretty good course here actually, so turn off Judge Judy or whatever you're doing on the side there, and uh, hopefully I can keep you guys interested. Uh, to start, I'm just going to kind of review the two technologies uh, that I'm going to be talking about today, uh, both hot tapping and line stopping, and then we'll get uh, just in a few minutes here, get right into the engineered side of things. Just want to make sure everybody is kind of starting from the same uh, basis points and has uh, understanding what line stopping and hot tapping is uh, to start with. All right, so let's start with a few of the basics here. Uh, what is hot tapping? Essentially, it's making a live connection to uh, not just pipe, but any infrastructure, tanks, pressure vessels of any kind. Um, we're going to start, I'm going to show you a video that's going to give you just a quick overview of what a hot tap is. As you can see, this is going to be on mechanical fittings. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to bolt up our mechanical T here. We're going to put a valve on, and we won't always use permanent valves, but you will always need a valve to complete a hot tap. Uh, nut bolt gasket set done up. Uh, everything's done up for manufacturer's recommendations, depending on your type of pipe. Hot tapping machine goes on. At this point, we're going to exercise that valve, make sure we're actually getting three turns per inch as per AWWA. That hot tapping, the valve's going to go up. Hot tapping machine is going to turn on. It's going to run through the pipe. It's going to cut out that pipe, what we call a pipe coupon, uh, which is the cutout. Pull it out, you see the U-wires there? That's what's holding that coupon in place so you don't lose it in the line. You're gonna pull it out, and then you're gonna close your valve, and now you can disconnect your hot tapping machine, and essentially you've just completed a live connection to that pipe. Lots of other stuff happens in the back end. We do our calculations, or you do your calculations. Uh, hopefully you guys are doing uh, hydrostatic testing or air testing uh, on both your service taps and your larger diameter ones. Uh, but that's the gist of how a hot tap works. I'm going to go over some real basic stuff here. I don't want to spend a lot of time on it. I'm kind of in this presentation assuming that you guys actually have a fairly good understanding of uh, basic hot tapping as it is. Uh, but there's kind of six or seven main types of service, so smaller diameter service hot taps typically below two and a half inches. Uh, the stainless steel, the bronze or brass, ductile iron, uh, an actual tapping sleeve with a threaded outlet, and then your, um, your hot tapping st uh, stuff for C301, C303, uh, PCCP, uh, reinforced concrete cylinder pipe. And then if you are on especially higher pressure uh, carbon steel, we recommend on any carbon steel actually just welding on a 3,000 pound half coupling or a thread outlet uh, to get those service connections off your carbon steel pipe. I don't want to spend a lot of time here, but I will mention a few things. If you are on HDPE or if you're on high pressure, uh, you'll typically want to use uh, the ductile iron tapping sleeve. Uh, Mueller actually makes ones good right up to 500 PSI. The rest of them are typically rated to 300 to 350 range. Um, so if you're above 200 PSI, I would recommend the ductile iron, the weld on if you're on carbon steel, or um, the threaded tapping sleeve, which is also typically good to 350 PSI. If you're on large diameter, by large diameter, I typically mean over 24 inches and you're doing a service tap, please, um, for the quality of your underground infrastructure over 25 inches, I would truly recommend switching to a full tapping sleeve uh, with threaded outlet just because um, that's a lot of uh, foot pounds to try and put on those, you know, 10 gauge or 14 gauge stainless steel bands. You should really have something uh, stronger in order to get gasket compression. Gasket compression, you're going to get so sick of me talking about gasket compression, but I'm a hot tapping geek. It's pretty much my world. So we'll go over lots of uh, gasket compression in this presentation here. Moving on. Um, Standard tapping sleeves, again, uh, we're going to go over all these tapping sleeves throughout the presentation in a lot more detail, but I just quickly want to just kind of go over what they are just so you have a rough idea. To start with, we have the fabricated tapping sleeve, the stainless steel tapping sleeve with um, 
full circumferential gasket, which is very different than a stainless steel tapping sleeve with outlet style gasket, which is at the bottom there. Uh, the circumferential gasket typically uh, 10 to 14 gauge stainless when uh, the stainless steel sleeve with the outlet style gasket is full, thick, rolled stainless steel, very different, different applications, uh, size availability, pressure ratings, all sorts of stuff. Um, you're going to see a fabricated steel tapping sleeve there with MJ outlet. You can actually put an MJ, and lots of guys don't know this, but you can actually put an MJ outlet on any tapping sleeve. Uh, there's not a ton of want for that in this market, uh, unless we're on high pressure, 350 PSI, usually class 350 ductile iron, uh, but you can definitely do that on any of your tapping sleeves. And then you have welded tapping sleeves, mechanical joint, and again, concrete cylinder. There might be one or two off there that I, I missed, but definitely in Western Canada, these are the main uh, hot tapping sleeves that you'll see on the day-to-day. -day. All right. Oh, let's go back there. So. One thing I do really want to talk about because uh, this always gets overlooked and I'm often very frustrated <laughs> talking to municipalities and engineers because I'll come up to site and they go, oh, we got this um, uh, full circumferential gasket uh, stainless steel sleeve here. It's the best. It works best on every piece of pipe. And uh, definitely don't believe that. Absolutely not true. Every tapping sleeve, there's a reason why they make different tapping sleeves and it's because they're good in different circumstances. If you're on PVC pipe, ductile iron pipe in good condition, or cast iron pipe, not size on size, in good condition, and AC pipe where you're more than two sizes down, some of that lingo might be confusing for you. Um, and I'll go through it a little more farther on. But you should be using either an uh, epoxy coated sleeve with outlet style gasket or um, or, uh, or, a, or a thick uh, stainless steel sleeve with outlet style gasket. Um, if you are on cast iron pipe, size on size, so that would be a 12 off 12, a 6 off 6, you should be using a full circumferential gas stainless steel uh, tapping sleeve. Or if you're on AC pipe, size on size, or one size down, so one size down would be a 10 off 12 or a 6 off 8, you should also be using stainless steel uh, repair clamp style gaskets or, uh, or full circumferential gaskets. Those sleeves are longer. They provide better beam loading. They also, if you do have leakage on that pipe, they will seal off that leakage. And uh, they do have a nice way of clamping around that pipe uh, not to crack it. I get this all the time. Oh, we should be using those on PVC as well. I don't know where that idea ever came from. It's definitely not what I would recommend on PVC. And I don't want to talk about this in too much detail. It's kind of, I have a whole other presentation that just talks about tapping PVC and PVC safety. But um, we order every sleeve we order, whether the city makes us order a stainless steel uh, circumferential gasket or whether we're able to order the sleeve we want. Every sleeve we order on PVC pipe is specifically ordered for PVC pipe in order to follow all Unibel's best practices. If you ever have someone say, oh, this sleeve works equally as good on cast iron, ductile iron, C900, and AC pipe, they don't know what they're talking about. I would uh, potentially review this, <laughs> review this presentation again or feel free to give us uh, a call and, and we can go through the specifics with you. Um, yeah, moving on. Uh, tapping sleeve two, again, if you have a basic knowledge of hot tapping, uh, which is the assumption we made in this course here, You'll understand most of these valves. There's only one I'm going to mention on the standard uh, tapping valve side, and that's a plug valve. We get calls all the time, hey, can you hot tap through this plug valve? I don't know about all plug valves, uh, but the Pratt plug valve, I know we can, uh, but it is reduced port size. So if you want, um, there's two things. One, after 12 inches, plug valves typically go to a square bore. We cannot hot hot tap through square bore because a 16 inch plug valve will give you a four inch hole, which most people aren't okay with. Uh, but a 12 inch plug valve, we can give you a 10 or an eight inch hole. And on a six inch plug valve, we'd be able to give you a four inch hole. So you can hot tap plug valves. You've got to reduce that cutter size. So if you need a eight inch hole on a 12 inch pipe, you'll have to go 
to a 10 inch plug valve and then decrease behind your plug valve to, uh, to the pipe size you want. All right, so line stopping. So this is the next technology that you're gonna see as we uh, slowly get into engineered hot taps, which is coming very quick here. I just wanted to review this technology as well so you have a good grasp of what this technology is uh, before uh, we get too far along. And some of you guys have probably seen this video before, but what a line stop is, is essentially inserting a mechanical stop into your infrastructure uh, without shutting down. So we'll watch this video real quick here and then we'll get right into the engineered hot taps. So what you're seeing is a leaky pipe. Uh, so you can use hot taps for this. Normally we're just putting in line stops to dead end lines to replace valves uh, that are broken, um, to uh, help with bypass pumping for line relocates, that sort of stuff. So again, this is all gonna start with the hot tap again. All of our technologies, except for line freezing, do start with the hot tap. Gonna open the valve just like we did in the first video here. Uh, pull that coupon out. And then this is where it's gonna get new, potentially for some of you guys. Pull it out, close that valve. Gonna pull that hot tapping machine off. Look at the coupon, make sure the coupon's there. Make sure it's in good condition. We're gonna run that bypass piping. And now we're gonna put the line stops on. We're gonna equalize, um, we're gonna set up our equalization. Those line stop heads are gonna go in. They're gonna open up. That's gonna stop your flow, hold back, hold back your pressure. Same on the other side. Then you're gonna drain out that middle section through that uh, purge equalization point there. This is just showing an option. You can go housing to housing. Typically reduced though, for a 16 inch stop, you'd be looking at a 12 inch bypass. You're gonna blow off and then you're gonna fix this pipe. In this case, they're uh, putting a new valve in. So once this is done, uh, you're gonna see um, them equalize this pipe. Just like large diameter butterfly valves, you need to equalize to get them out because it uses that pressure to seal. And then it's equalized, you'll pull those line stops out and then here's another technology you're gonna see a lot in the engineered fittings. We're gonna put a completion plug in. So you'll see open up these valves. They're all temporary valves in this point. We're gonna launch the completion plug in. And then we're gonna, set pins are gonna go on the side to hold it there. And then that's gonna allow us to pull all of our temporary valving offline. And we're gonna put blind flange on top there for final configuration. All right, if you've never seen it before, it's pretty cool technology. Um, I'm sure you're all super impressed. Um, so here we go, into the engineering hot taps. Uh, again, this is uh, new content. Uh, it's the first time I've presented some of this stuff. It's gonna be, uh, I'm pretty excited to show it to you guys. Hopefully you guys enjoy it as much as I do. So the first thing I'm gonna show you is a no valve hot tap, a butterfly valve, or a plug valve, or any valve or instrumentation at all. And I wish I had a room full of people right now because I love seeing hands go up. I go, who has seen this before? And there's probably maybe three of you in the room out of I don't know how many people we have here, 150, 200 people. Maybe three of you have actually seen someone hot tap through a butterfly valve, a plug valve, or a PRV for all I care. Uh, we can hot tap through anything, and I'll, sh I'll show you how right now. So the first thing I'm gonna show you is the most basic version of a no valve hot tap, and you actually just saw it in the video before, uh, whether you know it or not. So uh, this particular no valve hot tap is just a basic hot tap with a valve that we're gonna use for temporary basis. When do we use this? We either use it for a line stop, for a temporary bypass, where you don't want the valve left online at the end of the day because you don't want additional infrastructure that could potentially leak on you, or uh, sometimes we'll work with companies uh, like Pure Technologies or Pika who will do a non-destructive uh, pipe investigation with, robo well, with robots, or if you temporarily need to put a flow meter in, anything like that where you don't want uh, additional valves left online at the end of the day. So uh, what you can see here, you'll see the top of the line stop fitting looks very similar to your basic hot tap fitting, except there's a plug in there. And it's hard to see, uh, but 
Uh, at the bottom of the plug, you can see an O-ring there. So that's what we do. We set it down, that O-ring seals the pressure, and that allows us to remove that valve and get that blind flange on top. And then you're left with a double gasket seal. So you've got a seal on the O-ring, and you've got a seal on your gasket there, and you have pins sticking in the above chamber, and that's what holds it uh, from blowing off as you uh, pull that valving offline. So I'm going to show you, I know you guys just saw it, but this is new to a lot of you guys. So I'm going to show you again on, uh, hopefully it's not too redundant here, but I just want to show you this particularly, uh, the completion plug, because it's so important to most of our, a lot of our engineered hot taps. So again, that plug's going to go in. The pins, you can see the pins are going to go inside. They're going to stick in that top groove there, and the bottom groove has the O-ring, and that O-ring seals it with the pins, engin engineered pins that allow you to remove those valves offline. Again, do up those blind flanges and leave you with just a flange on top for final configuration. So, let's get into a case study here. So this is, um, oh. So this is a pretty common configuration you guys are gonna see. Uh, essentially it's a line stop with a bypass. There doesn't need to be a line stop. Sometimes we'll bypass around valves. Uh, sometimes um, we'll bypass around uh, like existing caps or plugs, anything like that. But it's pretty typical to do use completion plugs on bypasses or again for um, robotic testing or pig launching, anything along those lines. So what you can see on the left is the stop and bypass, and then on the right, that's the finished product. Uh, two completion plugs in there with just blind flanges on top. You can get all this stuff in stainless or epoxy coated, whatever your guys' city specs are. Again, here's another one. This is the line stop and purge equalization point. Same thing, just showing uh, different, um, different finishes on the fittings there. So the next one, and this is a little more interesting. This is what I talked about uh, at the beginning. Doing a hot tap through a plug valve, butterfly valve, or not even having a valve at all in your hot tap, if you're on, you know, uh, 84 inch sewer line and you go, wow, I need a 48 inch hot tap, but I don't want to spend $90,000 on a 48 inch gate valve for this hot tap. We can just run straight pipe through you and not install a valve at all. And this is the technology that allows you to do that. So what you can see is essentially a T fitting with a line stop plug. And this is, um, the drawing's actually uh, at an angle, but just imagine it laying down on its side. So if it goes clockwise 90 degrees, that's typically how you're gonna see the fitting. And some of you guys might already be like, oh, I get this, I know exactly what's gonna happen here. So that's good. Um, but we're gonna do a line stop off the top uh, right after we hot tap it. And let's, let's see the case study here, and I'll give you a good idea right away. So this is what the fitting looks like and what it's usually gonna look like in the field for you guys. And then here we go. So this one's actually in Kelowna. We just did this one, I don't know, like a month or two ago. Um, I think it's DR41 uh, PVC, but it is C900 grade. If it was uh, DR41 series grade, we would not be able to complete this hot tap. The risk of it uh, cracking would be too high, uh, but all C900 pipe is rated for hot tapping. So we're gonna bolt this up. And um, you see it going on the pipe now. Again, uh, this uh, fitting has been engineered for PVC pipes specifically, especially because it's thin wall. So we're rolling it right to the top of its OD range as per Unibel uh, recommendations. Low pressure line, 50 p uh, actually closer to 30 PSI. So we're putting a valve on the front. You don't actually need to put a temporary valve on the front, but it's kind of, if you have uh, enough travel in your uh, tapping machine, it's good to throw a valve on front just as an extra safety measure. Now you see the temporary valve going on the top. There's a completion plug below it. Now we're gonna put our line stop machine on there. Uh, where's the, oh, I don't have a photo of the hot tapping machine actually go, going through, but you put your hot tapping machine on it you don't, uh, your line stopping machine on it, but you don't lower it. When the line stopping machine's on it, you then complete your hot tap, pull it out. Now it's your pilot's out with the coupon. Then your line stopping machine goes in, as you see on the photo on the right there. 
And so you have a sealed pipe behind you. But this is great, right? There's no valve there, and we didn't actually truly hot tap through any valve. So you can now at this point bolt anything onto this. You can bolt on, uh, I don't know why you would, but a PRV or a plug valve, a globe valve, a butterfly valve, a specialty reduced port gate valve, anything you want essentially you can put on there and or no valve at all. And then what we're going to do now is put that valve on. Uh, or you could just run straight pipe and then when we pull the line stop out, it's just a connected system. In this case, we're putting a plug valve on there, and you can see it installed there. And then on the left is before uh, we've set the completion plug. After that, uh, on the left, we'll set the completion plug. Once completion plug set, you get what you see on the right there, which is the finished product. Again, kind of cool. I'm actually going to show it to you again, just so you can fully wrap your uh, brain around it. This fitting is an all-in-one fitting. So at some point, you run out of travel, and you just need bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger hot tapping machines. So ideally, we do it as one fitting uh, to reduce our overall uh, length. We call it the laying length. Um, but if you're on a big job uh, in the next one, a high press gone job, uh, what you'll sometimes want to do is not have all that jewelry to deal with and you'll want to do your hot tapping fitting and then you'll want a spool. So again we can do this through anything uh, or if you were hot tapping a blind flange for instance because you didn't want a blind flange and you didn't want a valve beside it you could use this spool as well or a modified version of this spool. Um, so what we're going to do is just take this spool, do almost exactly what we did on the last one except we're going to do it through just a hot tapping sleeve. So here's your hot tapping sleeve on the left. It's for uh, Hypresscon C301L. And then on your right, that is your modified T uh, for no valve operation. So here we go. Case study three, 30 off 30. Uh, can't be 30 off 30. It's got to be 30 off 24 for C301. Um, but we got a lot, anyway, large diameter hot tap on C301 uh, with a no valve. And this is going to be two piece setup. So here we go, we're actually doing our uh, high press gone hat, hot tap. Uh, later, I'm not showing you that hot tap in detail, I'm doing a big thing uh, in about 30 minutes for you on the high press gone hot tap. Uh, but the high press gone hot tap's done, and then they put the spool on, you can see in the photo on the right, the spool is on, that line stop is actually up in the can, and they're doing the hot tap right now. So right now, the pilot and the cutter is going through. It's tapping out that coupon. It's going to bring it back out past the line stop. Then the line stop is going to go down, which we see right there. And now we can tie in again, just like the last one, whatever we want. Uh, whether no valve, we're just uh, tying in direct pipe, or we want a plug or butterfly valve there. And then again, this one's another plug valve was installed. But you can also see the plug valve doesn't need to be right up to the T. In this case, they're a good 16, uh, 10 to 16 feet back where they finally put that plug valve, which is also super nice if you want uh, to put it in a chamber, but you don't want the rest of your infrastructure in that chamber too. So you, with this setup, you can also give yourself some room uh, for things like concrete chambers. Very cool. All right, the last one. This is typically used in the oil and gas industry. They always do this. Um, so they'll do a hot tap off the top and just tie in off the side and then actually complete on the top. So what you just saw, except vertical off the top with the connection being to the side and the completion plug being on the top. Um, so when you do see this in the water industry, it's typically, and this happens to us all the time, I will get a phone call, hey, I got to cancel this job. There's a storm main in the line, or there's a sanitary main in the line, or there's fiber optic or electric. And if I'm, I don't know how many people I'm talking to right now, but I'm sure every one of you that actually works in the field knows exactly what I'm talking about. And you'll say, oh, I can't do a hot tap, there's not room. And that is kind of true. There's not room with the, you know, off the shelf uh, fittings you have, but if you're willing to, there's two ways to do it, 45 degree hot tap, and then you put a 45 and then you abandon this valve and put a new valve here and run it out. That's one way to do it. 
Another way is to do it off the top, assuming you have uh, adequate ground cover, and you could do it you know, as far off the ground as you want. This is obviously a super deep hole that this one was built for, and uh, we're gonna hot tap that, and they're gonna run the new service off the side. So maybe it's, a, it's not, because it only looks like a 10 inch, but say you have a transmission line running below, it's really deep, and you wanna bring up your connection, this is a good way to do that. And most people in the water industry have never even seen this or heard of it. Uh, again, it's prevalent in the gas industry, but the water industry could take advantage of this too. If you're really deep and there's no reason for you to be that deep for your services, you can definitely uh, raise them up this way. Really cool technology. And again, same thing, hot tap goes through. You would be putting a valve horizontal there uh, in the closed position, obviously. <laughs> and then you hot tap it out and then you complete on top there. All right. Before you go on that, sorry. That yes, sir. The 30 by 24 question came in the chat. What, okay. what material was that that you were hot tapping? Can you go back? Uh, that was, uh, so that was C301, which is a, um, which is a concrete uh, cylinder pipe. Uh, PCCP, RCCP, some, uh, there's a bar wrap version of it. I'm gonna go through it in great detail in a half hour, you'll, you'll have everything you need to know uh, on one of the, the future um, case studies here. Great question, though. Uh, so reinforced concrete wall taps. Again, uh, lots of guys, even though when you think about it, it's so simple, lots of guys would never uh, think about uh, doing a hot tap through a re reinforced uh, concrete wall. So instead, uh, people will wait uh, till you know, spring or fall, and they'll drain, you know, um, drain the reservoirs of hundreds of thousands of liters, if not, you know, millions and millions of liters of water in order to do this tying off the side of it when really you could have hot tapped it any time of year and uh, not slowed down your construction process or, or held up schedule or anything like that. And um, uh, this is how you do it. So the, um, this is an example of a flat plate uh, reinf reinforced wall hot tap sleeve. And I guess you can look at the sleeve already. And I'll tell you, I've seen so many bad designs on this sleeve, it's, it's insane. And what I'll often see is uh, they'll go, oh wow, like we got a full plate, let's do a full gasket behind that entire plate, all gasket. And the uh, thing is, it's all about gasket compression. So what's 100 square inches of gasket compression versus 10 square inches of gasket compression? 10 times less compression. Uh, so what you actually want is two thinner gaskets, and you can see on the top it's showing the gasket, and it's in the arrow pointing down to two small gaskets versus one huge uh, neoprene or nitrile gasket. You'll never get I've seen so many of these wall sleeves leak over the years because there's just far too much gasket to actually get compression on those fittings. This is another option. This is what we would call a draw flange version. So if you don't have room for a big square plate, because uh, uh, not that we've ever worked in a tight hole before. I'm sure none of you guys have any idea what I'm talking about. But if you don't have room, uh, there's a way to reduce it. And essentially, it's a flange built off of a flange and then you'll run long studs and those long studs will bolt in and there's a gasket on the end and those long studs will come in and that's what's gonna give you your gasket compression on the end if you're tight for space. Or if in this case, uh, this one we're drilling into the base, it, this photo's upside down but it's actually the base of a manhole, concrete manhole, and then the wall of a concrete manhole so it's actually a differential wall and this is how we get around bolting to a differential wall if you need that invert very low on your manhole. All right, let's look at this one. So this one's for Metro Vancouver at the Langley Wastewater Treatment Plant. I'm sure some of you guys drive over that bridge and smell that beautiful stench every day. Know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, so this is a concrete wall. What do we do first? We come in and we x-ray the wall. And anyone that's ever worked on concrete before knows exactly why we x-ray the wall because if we didn't, uh, we would hit every single piece of rebar in there, guaranteed. So we x-ray the wall and then we best fit our fitting around that rebar 
Uh, if there is any engineers on the line, just know your invert might change by a centimeter or two. It's okay, we can breathe. It'll all be all right. Um, but we'll best fit it around that rebar, drill those uh, holes for the Hilti anchors, and then we're gonna bolt that sleeve to it, making sure we get good gasket compression. If you've designed a fitting or are working on a fitting that doesn't get two thirds gasket compression, so when you can press that fitting down onto the wall or onto your pipe, if you're using mechanical hot tapping sleeves, you wanna see it compress from full down to one third of its original thermometer. Um, and that's adequate gasket compression. Um, so we're gonna try and get it compressed down to one third and we'll be measuring that. And what you're seeing, those black marks on there, that's the guys going around with their torque wrenches, 30%, 30%, 30%, and then 10% up to your 100% torque. So slowly going around there, and that's gonna give you nice, even, concentric gasket loading. Men, why is this guy still talking about gaskets? I'm so sorry, but that's what this whole presentation is. It's pretty much just gasket compression, so we're gonna keep going here. Next, we're gonna throw the 24-inch valve on there, and wow, that's a weird hot tapping machine. Uh, that's a hot tapping machine that we typically use uh, for our large diameter uh, reinforced concrete and concrete cylinder pipes. All right, and there you go. That's your completed uh, hot tap on reinforced concrete wall. So uh, one other thing to note, uh, lots of time on these large diameter hot taps, especially on the west coast where we're really shallow berry, uh, guys always wanna go bevel gearing on this. You gotta be really careful with bevel geared um, valves on reinforced concrete hot taps because what happens is that slurry comes out, slurry comes out, slurry comes out as you're hot tapping and then it comes and it sits in your gate channel and then you go to close that gate and all that slurry crumples up into a big hard ball and you can't close it the last inch. It's only an inch, not a big deal, right? No, it's a big deal, it's a lot of poop. It's a lot of poop coming at you. So uh, you just gotta make sure if we do go with a bevel gearing, we need a way to flush out that um, slurry and there's lots of ways to do it. One by extending the nozzle and putting a clean out the at the bottom or one just by cycling water uh, through that high pressure water, which I mean when you're working on low pressure sewer, all water is pretty much high pressure water. Uh, make sure you have a backflow uh, preventer on there. But um, uh, just flush that water to keep, keep that concrete slurry out of your valve. Uh, valve gate there. All right, here's another one I just want to show you. It's, you can do all these fittings. All these fittings you can do in 316, 304, or you can throw an MJ, MJ, uh, MJ flange on the end of that too. All right. So question before you go on. Uh, yes, sir. Are they using hot taps or ice picking or flange picking? Uh, so we'll we don't do the ice picking, but we will uh, do hot taps to provide access for that for sure. Uh, most of the time we'll just do a hot tap vertical off the top or wherever they want it. And I'll get into 45 degree hot taps a little later on too, uh, but we'll do it. And so if they want to abandon the valve, it's just a basic hot tap. If they don't want the valve left online, the very first case study we went through there, you can totally uh, do that, which is just complete, and be, be left with that flying flange at the end of the day. Great question. Uh, so yeah, uh, pigging or um, uh, pig launching, any, anything like that, you can do the access for. Uh, where am I at here? All right, steel and stainless steel uh, tank, blind flanges, and end caps. This is the easiest engineered fitting we have, because what do you do? It's easy, it's carbon steel, you just weld it. Uh, so here we go. This is what you would typically use for a carbon steel blind flange or a carbon steel end cap, anything carbon steel or a carbon steel tank. If it's flat, uh, you can do this. So I couldn't, for whatever reason, I couldn't find a drawing. Um, this is just a nozzle. If you're on thin wall, uh, and we'll run the uh, AWWA M11 calcs for you, so you won't have to worry about it, just let it, or or your fitting manufacturer can run your M11 calcs for you. Um, but if you are thin and you are on higher pressure for whatever reason, you might need a reinforcement collar, a uh, repad, uh, some guys just call it a collar. Um, as you can see, the collar's on there. Um, it would obviously be flat if you were on a tank or a blind flange uh, or, 
for uh, end cap, uh, but you may or may not need a reinforcing collar. If you're uh, you know, on 10 gauge or something like that, you, you might want to get that even just for uh, support of your hot tapping machine. So here's another one. Uh, again, I, I have never had to draw up a flat wall because we just go out and do it, but uh, you can imagine it's just a, if you want to go two inch or below, it's just a thread alette or a 3,000 pound half coupling right on that wall. I've seen guys just weld nipples on there. Please don't do that. Uh, it's really not strong enough. We have fairly heavy, high pressure uh, hot tapping machines. And if you're doing flat wall stuff, you guys will be using your bigger machines as well too. Uh, just spend the extra $10 and put a half coupling uh, on there if you need a wall tap. Um, let's do a case study on this one. Uh, so in this one, we're an industrial facility. I'm not allowed to tell you uh, what facility or where it is, uh, but I was allowed to take some photos here, so we'll go through it. So we're at this industrial facility, and um, we have essentially a big hopper here. Uh, there's an incident, they need to drain the hopper, and the valve at the bottom of the hopper is no longer working. Um, so what we are doing is, and this isn't even water, it's actually a powder substance. So we're hot tapping right through the wall uh, to get uh, this powder substance out. And what you have is just a flange nozzle. In this case, we're putting a knife gate on there and we're hot tapping up at roughly uh, inverted 30 degrees and that's gonna allow these guys to drain out uh, that powder. So if you guys, I mean, most of you guys are in water and sewer. It's not, a, it's not a big issue for you. If you are ever on a chemical or a powder that you don't know, you need to make sure <laughs> that the properties will not allow ignition or explosion. Uh, so that's always something to take into consideration. You guys probably won't do it unless you run across an old line, and this happens in municipalities everywhere. We get these phone calls. You run across an old line. Uh, I have no idea what this is. Let's do a test tap because we think it's dead. Before you do that test tap, you have to run an inert gas into it, CO2 or nitrogen. If you've never done it before, please don't start here. Uh, give a professional a call and they'll come do that test tap for you. Uh, but you just have to run that inert gas in, which is what we did here. Even though we knew it wasn't explosive, uh, you still run that inert gas in just in case um, uh, you have residue in the air that's ignitable. All right, case study seven. So this one was on a tank. This one's gonna be on an end cap. Whether you're on an end cap we originally thought when we were going to site we were going to be tapping out a blind flange. We got there, it ended up being an end cap. The process is the exact same. So this one's unique because what's happened here is typically you'd keep these fittings as short as possible so that you could use as small as hot tap machine as possible because that cutter needs to travel the distance of the nozzle what we, and the valve, what we call the laying length. So if you move that nozzle way out, well now you're bringing an excavator to a backhoe job, right? You need a really long hot tapping machine to finish that off. As you can see the bonnet in the top left there, it's intruding on that space. We wouldn't be able to fit a 10 inch flange there. So we had to bring the nozzle out past that bonnet. Therefore, we need to bring a really big tapping machine out to get this job done. This is all 3,000 pound stuff, which means 3,000 pound Fittings, uh, this, this is all rated up to 720 PSI design. In reality, it's running at 210 PSI. 300 pound valve on there. You can see that big long rail machine in order to get through there and complete that hot tap. And then uh, here's, uh, here's the cutout there. So uh, actually end caps are a lot easier in blind flanges. 300 pound blind flanges, that's a long day. It's pretty much hot tapping all day to try and get through you know, something that thick. Uh, end caps are a lot nicer. Tap like that um, takes 15, 20 minutes. Usually, uh, we usually allow for 10 to 15 minutes per lin uh, lineal inch of cutting. If someone's done in five minutes, they cut way too fast. Uh, you should be scared. All right, let's keep moving on. So <clears throat> this brings us to non-weldable blind flanges. So weldable blind flanges, I think everybody gets it. It's easy. Take off the coating, uh, weld your nozzle on a bare st steel, make sure someone's done the M11 calcs uh, to make sure it's actually uh, adequate for the pressure in the pipe. But now we're on uh, you know, a ductile iron 
In this case, it wasn't ductile iron. It ended up being some sort of, a, I don't know if it's fiberglass or Kevlar or Teflon or something. I don't really know what it was. It wasn't PVC. But we got to a blind flange. We need to hot tap this blind flange. And this happens all the time, right? Um, oh, I'm going to develop this 10-acre um, uh, property in Port Kells. You know, that next property, it's not going to develop for 10 years. I'm going to be retired in five. That's someone else's problem. Don't waste the money on the valve. Just throw a blind flange on there. Well, we know how Vancouver's going. 10 years is actually two years. Two years later, you get out there, you go, oh, my goodness. We need to throw up another tilt-up building right there, and we got a blind flange, and now, you know, half of Port Kells is pumping in this line. We can't shut down half of Port Kells. Well, we'll just hot tap through the blind flange, and this is exactly what happened. I think this one was in Coquitlam a few years back, though. So we're going to hot tap through a non-steel blind flange with a 24-inch connection here. How the heck are we going to do that? So let's remove... Uh, let's remove all the bolts from this blind flange. Not all at once. Let's do them one at a time. Otherwise, again, you end up really poopy. And what are we trying not to do here? We're trying to not get poopy. So pull these bolts out one at a time. And we're going to replace them with uh, studs. So uh, nut, stud, nut, up tight, leaving lots of room there. And right beside it, you see uh, this modified spool. It's a, I would say it's a modified spool into draw flange. Draw flange meaning you're pulling that flange in to get gasket compression. If I had a room full of people right now, I'd say, how are we going to compress this gasket? Because I've said like six times now, I'm probably not a soul is listening. And one lonely soul would put up his hands to one third. And uh, so we're going to compress that gasket to one third, throw it on, and get compression. And you can see here, bolting that in, to push it, get that gas compression. This guy's still talking about gas compression. Valve open, hot tap it out, and there we go. There's our nice poopy coupon. And again, I, someone, if you know what material that is, you give, me a, give me a shout and let me know because it's not PVC. But it was definitely, uh, definitely cut nice. It's fiberglass, you think? It yeah, it, could, it was kind of rigid for fiberglass, but it, it could have been. Um, all right. I'm so used to asking uh, for questions after all these case studies. I think after two years, I wouldn't anymore. But um, all right. Hot tapping non standard pipe, PCCP, RCCP, AWWA C301, C303. So earlier we had a question about hot tapping this pipe. <clears throat> and here we go. We're going to go into uh, pretty good detail here. So. How am I doing for time? Do you guys know what time it is? Quarter to two. Quarter to two. Oh, wow, I'm, I'm boogieing. I started at one. OK, so I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but um, I almost need to start by telling everybody what's the difference between these uh, pipes. So C3, what they all have in common, uh, at least all the CCP that you're going to see in Western Canada, is they have concrete or mortar. Then they have a steel cylinder. Then they have wire wrapped around that steel cylinder, and then they have concrete on top. So C301, you know, typically made by Hypresscon in Western Canada, um, has high tension wire. So it's a thinner gauge steel, 12 to 14 gauge steel, and then 150,000 PSI on those wires wrapped around that cylinder. C303, uh, what people you know, it's commonly referred to as pretension, which just confuses everybody. Uh, you know, um, pre-stressed versus pretensioned, very similar. No one can figure it out. So people have reverted to calling it bar wrap pipe now. And this is just a thicker cylinder, uh, usually 10 gauge, and then the, the bar wrapped around it. It uh, still has some tension on it, but it's a lot less, like 10,000 PSI versus 150,000 PSI. All right, so uh, just due to lack of time, I'm not going to go into too much more detail, but I think this presentation is available after, so you just come back and you, you can read through this if you're interested in it. And um, you might not think that you have this or will come across this type of pipe in, in your career, but there's a lot of it around, believe it or not. Vancouver Island has it. Uh, definitely Crofton has a big line. The whole city runs off of it. 
Um, North Vancouver has it. Uh, City of Vancouver has it, Burnaby has it, Surrey has it, Abbotsford Mission have it, um, and then Vernon, Kelowna, uh, Penticton have it. Anyway, Cranbrook, Prince George, they all have it. There's lots of it around. And uh, guys are really scared of it because of that 150,000 pound pretension, but don't worry, there is a safe way to hot tap it and to line stop it uh, for that matter, so let's get into it. Again, gasket compression. This guy's still talking. Okay. While you're on gaskets, what is your life expectancy of these gaskets? Uh, 50 years. Yeah. So that, I mean, that's just the requirement is that all these fittings are designed to 50-year design life. So that's what I tell people. In reality, it could be a lot longer. I know if, if fittings are sitting in our shop for over two years, uh, we pull the gaskets off and redo them. But that's sitting in a non-compressed state in open air. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think definitely 50 year design life. I would think it's longer. Like how long are Vic fittings lasting? Probably 100 years. Well, maybe we don't know yet. <laughs> but we'll know soon, give it another 20 years. Um, so uh, again, gas compression, in this case, we're gonna put a sleeve on and that's gonna stay there, grout it, and then we're gonna pull it in again with that draw flange. We'll get into a case study right away here. So this one, case study number nine, this is a high Prescon line, 30 inch connection. This is actually in Delta. This is a Tilbury area. It's a main Tilbury line. So you guys probably remember this. What's happening is the South Fraser perimeter roads running through here. So this is what, back in 2011, 2010. South Fraser perimeter roads running through the bottom. They obviously don't want a 30 inch high Prescon line crossing a highway in the middle of Burns Bog. Uh, if you guys know the Burns Bog area, 30 feet of peat. So what they're gonna do is uh, tie a new line in HDPE to run alongside uh, the South Fraser Perimeter Road and they're gonna cap and abandon it there. So let's go through the process. Here's the pipe. This is far more pipe than I would normally like to see exposed, uh, but there's just a lot going on in this area which is why they expose so much. But what we really like to see is you to expose the spring line and just dig out where the hot taps are gonna be. Uh, just to keep that pipe as well supported as possible. Uh, so they're putting the fitting on, and what they're going to do is they're going to put the fitting on, they're going to mark out the outside of the concrete uh, for what concrete needs to be removed, then they're going to pull that fitting offline. Fitting comes offline, they're going to start grinding. You need to know the depth of your wires because if you see sparks, you run into some big problems, especially on C301. Make sure you keep that grinder well above where those wires are going to be. Um, so you grind it. And then this is just showing you the fitting. So that's the main fitting on the right. This is the draw flange. You might already be putting it together how we're gonna pull those together to get that gasket compression. So here we go, we're chipping. And uh, man, I've seen a video before where guys literally take an air jackhammer to this. Do not do that, ever. Milwaukee, the smallest little hammer drills you can find. Uh, you really wanna take your time. If it takes an extra hour, so be it. Uh, take your time. Slowly working it away here, pulling all that concrete all the way down to the steel can. And then there's our supports. Honestly, we should have, uh, looking back, should have done even a little more support, a little bit of cribbing probably. Pulling all that way down. Once all that's down, we're gonna put that fitting on. Straps, why are we using straps? So uh, Hypresscon Amron purposely made their uh, pipe not round and not smooth, why? because this is usually like 24 to 96. I've seen 114 inch, I haven't seen it, I've seen photos of, but uh, 24 to 114 inch pipe. Can you imagine the thrust blocks on this thing? So they purposely made their pipe not smooth uh, in order that it has a high friction factor so they can minimize thrust blocking. So because of that, we actually use stainless steel straps versus a hard back in order to get it nice, even compression. So torque it up, I don't have a photo of it, but we grout it, then we let it sit and harden. And then uh, once that's done, once it's torqued up, then we cut the wires. So guys always say, do you, need a, do you need a weld the wires down? This is 14 gauge steel. Uh, so you're trying to weld a high tension wire to 14 gauge steel. You better make sure you have a hell of a good welder uh, if you wanna weld this to the steel cylinder. We we just say don't weld it to steel cylinder. You're far more likely to put a hole in the cylinder 
uh, by what, trying to weld it than you are to have it unwind. The fitting's designed to friction hold that concrete that will hold that wire from unwinding. So it's all the AWWA M9 specifications. Uh, it should be good. Uh, don't try to weld to it in, uh, unless you're feeling real good about things. All right, so we're gonna cut it and then we're gonna buff around where that gasket's gonna go. Right now they're lowering that gasket down and we put pipe soap on it to drop it down and then we just make sure we can see a full line of pipe soap to make sure we have a nice fit on that. There we go, you can see, it's hard to see, but there's a buff ring around there. Nice, smooth, it fit well. Now we're gonna put it down, and here we go. See the studs on there? So we use the studs, we do up the studs again, 30, 30, 30, 10 for 100%, and then we're gonna use a feeler gauge in there to make sure we've compressed it down to one third of the gasket. And, um, and then it's hard to see, but there's actually, if you look at the studs, there's actually another, uh, um, another bolt in there, and that bolt is like a reverse uh, stud. It's a bearing stud. So it's holding it there, and it just sits blunt end against the bottom flange, and that's to stop it from pushing in. Because you can see, wow, we just put a, you know, a 2,500 pound valve on top of that. Oh no, it's 24 inch, so what is that? It's more, probably, yeah, probably 3,000 pounds. So that's gonna to wanna to push into that cylinder, so you need those bearing uh, bolts there to hold it from pushing in. And then we'll, later we're gonna concrete encase it as well. You don't always have to do that. For a line stop, uh, you probably should on, uh, on these sorts of pressures. Alrighty. Once that's on, hot tapping machine. This is an old cutter around 2012. We now do all these hot taps with diamonds. Uh, diamond technology's gotten a lot better over the years. They can now make some diamonds that uh, will actually uh, deal with high torque, um, uh, low, uh, low RPM. So we switch to diamonds. Uh, that'll go on. We're going to hot tap this out. Again, tapping machine on. Uh, count your turns out uh, to make sure you're all the way open. Go down and lots of measurements and stuff done on the back end. There's your coupon. You can see there should be concrete at the bottom of that coupon. On C301, you often lose that concrete. So that's uh, at the bottom of the pipe, it's sewer. Um, it'll stay down there for the rest of its uh, life, especially on sewer where that inner lining gets weaker over the years. Uh, you have the potential to lose the concrete off the bottom. On Amron, or uh, I should say C301, you're a lot less likely uh, to lose that concrete liner just because it's often a mortar and it's often thinner, so it's less likely uh, to get lost in the hot tapping process. All right, blind flange on there. This is a line stop, so now the purge equalization point's going on here. I'm gonna roll through this pretty quick for you guys. It's the exact same process as before. Smaller hot tapping machine. Uh, you can see it's grouted. We grout that uh, nozzle after. This is the bypass tap, which we showed you. The 30, it goes 30, 24, then, then back up to 30 inch HTPE. Why would we put a 24 inch valve on 30 inch HTPE? What's the ID of 30 inch HTPE? 30 inch OD. Uh, the ID of it's probably like 25. So you're just saving $40,000 on a valve and uh, it's not, you're not actually losing any capacity out of it. It's the first thing I always look for when I'm going through drawings to make sure if it's HDP especially, they're reducing their valve size because uh, I'm a cheap Dutchman. I like saving money as much as the next guy. Um, cut the wires, pull it out, torque it in. Again, you're looking for that compression. All right, so the bypass tap's done, the line stop tap is done, the PE point's done. We're gonna throw our cathodic on there. You see they dropped some anodes on there and some denso tape. And now what are they doing over here? We're putting a stop in there, so they're doing a dead man, or a reverse thrust block anyway. And now, I, man, I wish I had a room full of people because is this not the most beautiful reverse thrust block you've ever seen in your life? Look at that thing, I have coffee on that. Um, so once that's done, and again, um, is it over-engineered? I don't, I don't actually know. I, I don't know the calcs nor, or anything like that. It, it's a lot more than most of the, the guys we work with do. Most of them just back up the, <laughs> the concrete truck and dump it in there. Um, we're going to backfill it. 
and then we're going to put the lines up on there. So like I said, that concrete drop to the bottom, this is a sweep. We've got to sweep it out of the way, which is what you're seeing here. Long pull. Guys, do it like the old, uh, those old rail car riders, back and forth, sweep it out of the way. Then this is your line stop machine. Line stop's going to go on there. Once it's stopped, captain abandoned. So we're going to pull it off. We're going to weld to that cylinder, 14 gauge cylinder. Make sure you have a good welder. Uh, Metro Vancouver has three, maybe four companies that are pre-qualified to weld on a cylinder like this. I recommend just getting Metrovan's list and using one of their welders because I know uh, those guys can actually do it. It can be a little tricky. Um, Denso tape this and rod it back, and there you go, final configuration. Dead ending, uh, you know, a fairly high pressure 30 inch line is not uh, easy and it's not uh, that cheap, but it can definitely be done. And uh, I mean, as all our infrastructures, you know, nearing 50, 60 years old, it's going to need to be done more and more here. Whew. All right, that was a lot of information. Hopefully, you guys are keeping up. Hopefully, uh, Judge Judy hasn't won you over yet, and I'm still uh, center of attention. Uh, let's, Chris, Chris yes, sir. Came in about size limitations on plus capping, so like 24 on a 30. Yeah. Yes, it is very material specific. Great question though. I should have covered that back in the standard hot tap. So uh, PVC, AC, ductile iron, cast iron, and steel, carbon steel pipe and stainless steel pipe can all be done up to size on size. HDPE, uh, because of the reduced ID, because the wall is so thick, we can do roughly 10% lower than the size of the ID. So if you're on 24 inch DR11, my guess is the ID is around 20 inches. We'll give you like a 17 inch hole on that, but your capacity is only really reduced from 20 to 17 and just at that isolated area. And then high press gone and Amron as well. Um, you can go one size down and that's also because of limited ID. And then on fiberglass and in some of the weirder ones, it's all case by case basis. So that'll have to go back to the engineers and they'll let us know based off of the pressure, uh, the maximum size outlet we can get on that. Great question. All right, uh, let's do a quick uh, HDPE one here. Um, oh, I got a sneeze, sorry. It's gonna come. Uh, so mechanical versus fuse on HDPE tap. I get asked about this First, I always get asked, can you do an HDB a hot tap? Question answer is definitely yes. And we just talked about, that was a great question, uh, the size we can go, which is 10% down from the ID of the pipe. Um, people then ask, well, should I fuse on or should I use a mechanical fitting? And my answer is always, oh, whatever you want to do. Um, the thing is, both have their own unique limitations. So. For the mechanical fittings, uh, make sure you're using an outlet gasket. Never ever, I don't care what the manufacturer tells you, never use a full circumferential gasket on HDPE. It might not leak when you first install it, but the chances of it leaking at some point are high. You want to really get good, solid, high PSI gasket compression there. Um, so anyway, on the mechanical fitting size, uh, there's a nozzle issue. So say you have 12 inch HDPE, you want a six inch nozzle. Well, that nozzle is gonna be like a DR7 or a DR11. So the hole we can actually give you in that is gonna be like three inches, maybe three and a half inches because the wall's so thick. Uh, when if you use a six inch mechanical fitting, it's an oversized nozzle, so we can give you a five and a half inch hole there. Uh, but for HDPE, you can always just up, if you really want fuse on, just upsize your fuse on and then you'll just have to um, uh, do a concentric decreaser uh, or a concentric reducer after your valve, uh, but you will spend a little bit more money on your valve to get to that capacity. Um, the other thing is um, Fuse-on is often limited by a few things. Uh, DR, so if it's too thin, you might not be able to fuse to it. If it's too old, and usually when I call our supplier, anything kind of 
you know, mid 90s and older, they won't want us to fuse on. We'll have to use a mechanical fitting. And that's just a general rule. Like if you have a pipe around the mid 90s and you really want to fuse on, definitely call and see if you can do it. And then back again in the early 90s, they put out a bunch of like metric size pipe and weird size HDPE. It kind of wasn't standardized yet. Uh, and some of that stuff, if it was possible, the cost of manufacturing those fittings is so astronomical, uh, you'll really want to go with the mechanical fitting as well. So the, the cons to the mechanical fitting is that it's non-like for like material, which just means that the expansion, contraction, and thermal properties are a little mismatched. Um, Again, you guys know your infrastructure better than me. Like, I've personally seen more fuse-on fittings blow off in the imme immediate like process. Never during the hot tap, but during the testing, because we'll always hydrostatic or CO2 test it. I've seen more blow off, more fuse-ons blow off than I've ever seen mechanical fittings leak. But you know, I'm not looking at these lines 10 years later either. We're usually um, leave next day, so. Uh, talk to your engineer, talk to the manufacturers, see what, see what they think, depending on your infrastructure. Um, and I guess for the fuse-on fittings, it's all just the reverse of the pros and cons. It is like for like material. It has similar contract, uh, you know, uh, thermal expansion. Ex I've lost my words here, but you know what I'm saying. Uh, similar properties is like for like, and a lot of people um, like, like having you know, just HTTP within their infrastructure minus the DI valve, so. All right, any questions come up for that one? Good. Okay, let's keep going. So I'm gonna, oh, that being said, um, if you wanna know more about mechanical fittings on HTTPE, JCM, you just Google search at JCM Industries, HTTPE engineering book or, or whatever it's called. This goes through great detail on, um, on you know, your options, and I'm sure uh, the other fitting manufacturers have something similar as well, but I know this is the most in-depth one, and if you want, uh, email me. I'll even send you the original test documents where they did all the testing on the different types of fittings, different types of gaskets, uh, and whatnot uh, for how they chose what type of fitting should be acceptable mechanically on HTPE. All right. Case study 10. I'm probably running out of time. What are we at? No, no, you, got lots of time. you don't know how many case studies I got left. So okay, perfect. Uh, so we're going to get through this. So case study 10, this is a line stop and a bypass on HTPE. And uh, we're going to teach you how to do a really affordable bypass pumping as well. Um, so here we go, YVR. We love the airlines because they're always expanding those runways, and they always run their infrastructure right at the end of it. So we always get to come in and move it with every expansion, and uh, it's every airport. Um, and this is no exception. So over at YVR a few years ago, and what you see there, that line is their existing uh, sanitary sewer line. It's all, there's a new mall over there, and then the YVR terminal itself, and a little bit of housing. All that sewer is running up to the Iona wastewater treatment plant. Uh, so we got to keep it flowing, otherwise there's going to be some expensive insurance claims there. Um, so this is what it needs to look like at the end of the day. So how are we going to get there? Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to run the permanent piping, but use it as a bypass. So if you want to save a whole bunch of money, don't run independent bypass. Use the permanent infrastructure as your bypass pumping while you complete the tie-ins. Save, probably save a quarter million dollars on this job. I'm just making up numbers. Could have been nothing. I don't know. Um, so here we go. What are we going to do? We're going to do a two, hot, uh, two hot taps, one vertical off the top for a line stop, and one off the side for a bypass. In this case, uh, some good engineers ran the numbers and told us we can reduce down to a 12-inch bypass for, I think they gave us a week that we could do that. So what's a 16-inch valve versus a uh, 12-inch valve, half the price. So save a whole bunch of money on valving here. Um, so this is what it looks like. One limitation to HDPE is if you're doing line stops on it, it has to be a mechanical fitting. It can be stainless or uh, epoxy-coated carbon steel, but it does need to be a mechanical fitting, and it does need to be an outlet-style gasket. It will not do it on a uh, full circumferential gasket. 
So uh, here's your fittings. In this case, they're abandoning valves. They're not going to do the completion plugs on top. Uh, and now we're going to shoot, I wish. Hopefully you guys can see it. So you see the two new valves in line on their new infrastructure. Those are going to be closed for good reason. And then we're going to run the bypass. So it's going to come up through that 12-inch bypass into the new permanent uh, 16 or 18 inch, I can't remember, 16 inch pipe and around, and then uh, hit that closed valve and then go through that 12 inch bypass again, and then boom, back out up to Iona. And while that's being done, the line stops are in and they're gonna complete those two tie-ins at that end there. So here you see they're running. So there is a little bit of temporary bypass piping going in here, but I mean it's, uh, what, 100 feet versus kilometers if they'd done uh, temporary bypass piping the whole way, and then you have a pipe sitting above ground in the middle of your airport, which is never ideal either. Uh, here's the other side where the tie-in is, so you can see the line stops going in there. And then uh, our crews, they never actually took photos of uh, the, hot, uh, the line stops in, so I stole a photo from a, a different job for the last one here, but here's your Line stop, so sewers running down, hitting that line stop, backing up, and then going out that 12 inch, um, that 12 inch temporary bypass into the new infrastructure and around. And here's what it looks like. This is a different job. This one's actually up in Whitehorse, uh, but it's the same idea. Sewer hits that line stop up and around, and uh, that's that's roughly what your line stop head looks like from the inside. And this is the final configuration. So uh, lots of people will leave that temporary bypass in place, especially if you end up with a valve there in a valve chamber. Then you have future bypass accommodations if you ever need to work on that valve chamber there. All right. So hot tapping, non-standard pipe, in this case, reinforced concrete pipe. So very similar. <clears throat> to hot tapping and reinforced concrete wall, except this time it's a sleeve. Uh, so the only real difference on this between uh, normal sleeves is the ODs typically a lot bigger. This would also have a reduced uh, sleeve. Again, we would go 10% below that of the ID of the pipe. Um, and again, we have the double gasket. On concrete, we always have the double gasket just because it's porous and it's kind of like our fail safe. So, if for whatever reason it passes the first gasket, the second gasket will hopefully stop it there. So here's an example, a reinforced concrete tap. You can see we're running diamonds in this as well. Uh, open the pipe and tap through it. <clears throat> and there is a ton, as you guys know, uh, like Metro Vancouver, the infrastructure is a, in a lot of places undersized and a lot of this sanitary sewer that used to run a third of the way full that you could just tie into is now fully surcharge, like manholes bolted down to the road kind of thing, otherwise they'd be blowing, you know, six feet in the air. Um, so uh, we see more and more of uh, hot taps on both storm, where you're under the water table, and uh, uh, sewer, where, where you're fully surcharged. All right, this is another one. So this is a large diameter. So we, for the most part, try and stay to two bolts, but when... Um, uh, two bolt section, sorry, so at horizontal, which just makes it easier to install. And when you're rigid, epoxy coated carbon steel, or when your thick wall is stainless, it stays rigid enough, you can get that gasket compression straight down uh, versus needing it to pull this way in order to get that gasket compression. But when you get this big, so this is a 72 off 36 RCP line, uh, we do need to go to the three bolt style. Next is the plate style hot tapping sleeve on reinforced concrete pipe. I hate these fittings on an angle. They're great flat on an angle, they're awful. Uh, try, if you can, to buy full circumferential gaskets. You'll get really good gasket compression, you'll get a really good quality tap. These are always difficult for a lot of reasons. One, they're often designed with too much gasket, so you can't get gas compression. Two, you're trying to hilty on an angle. So you drill your holes, you put your sleeve on, and then you put your hilty bolts through, and then you hilty uh, your center ones first to get that, and then you kind of pull it around to try and get full gasket compression. 
it's really only good, you know, maybe you get a 50 PSI design on it. You get a full circumferential gasket, we can get up to 350 PSI design on that. So you're obviously getting much better gasket compression, much better hold there. Um, really try and go full circumferential if you can. Um, if not, just make sure you got a good wall design and a company that knows what they're doing. The other problem is, especially on small diameter, like we'd rather do this on a, on a 96 inch reinforced concrete pipe than we would on a 24 inch. And that's just because a 96 inch probably has eight to 10 inches of wall, when a 24 inch only has like six, four to six inches of wall. It's really hard to get your hilty anchors to seat within four inches and it ends up being a bit of a fight. So uh, again, can be done and we do it uh, all the time. Uh, we've gotten pretty good at it over the years, but if you can do full circumferential and get an OD on that, for sure do it. I mean, if you're gonna spend $50,000 on removing giant cradles, especially piled cradles at the bottom of the pipe, yeah, this is, this is probably your way to go. All right, let's do a case study on this one. This is a 24 inch, um, there you go. Uh, 24 inch, the same hot tapping machine you saw on the reinforced concrete pipe that does most of our large diameter concrete work. Um, and you're gonna bolt that down. This one, uh, because it's such a big sleeve, it's not like a hard rubber gasket. It's, um, I can't remember what it's called, but it's like a thin, um, it's like a thin, almost like a, almost like a foamy, but it's super um, tight bubbles, so it can actually get good compression. It's not gonna get you very high uh, PSI, but most of these lines are only running at five to 10 PSI. I mean, it'll get you probably up to 25, no problem. And that's the way to do it, because you actually get good compression, you get some spring in it, holding in there. And unlike most where we would go to one third, this is going to like 5% um, because you start so thick. And that's the only way you can really get it on this particular fitting, get good gasket compression. Um, hot tapping non-standard pipe, fiberglass. So we've done like probably three of these in the last year and uh, none of our guys took any pictures for me, unfortunately. So all I can, sh all I can show you is the shop drawing um, or an example shop drawing. It's kind of hard to see, but what happens, if you guys know fiberglass, super malleable, like even more malleable uh, than HDPE. And what happens is it'll pinch. So you're bolting it down and where your two sleeves come together, it'll kind of pinch in and potentially damage that fiberglass pipe. So what this is, it's, it is like a typical outlet style gasket. You can see the gasket durometer, but what they do is, um, they do just a thin rubber all the way around it and that rubber just protects that pipe from getting pinched or indented. And then to stop uh, that indenting, they've actually gusseted over the bolts there. If you look up where the bolts are going through on the top and bottom, you can actually see a half inch, or I can't see, I'm not wearing my gasket, uh, my glasses, but it looks like a half inch, still talking about gaskets, man. Uh, that half that half inch plate there that is locking it into place so that it stays fully rigid and that it just goes straight up and down and it, it doesn't uh, pinch, pinch in at all. Um, that's how you do fiberglass. We've also in the past done super thin wall PVC uh, with this fitting, uh, but when we, as soon as we're, as soon as you're on series PVC and you're above 26, uh, DR, essentially you're, we'll do it for you, but essentially it's at full risk of the uh, owner. And again, we've done many, many, many uh, successfully, but the risk of uh, the risk of it cracking does go up significantly once you get above uh, DR26 only on series PVC, uh, C900 PVC, all, all DRs can be hot tapped. Whew, a lot of information. Hopefully you guys are taking notes. Uh, engineered hot taps, tangential. Uh, I'm sure lots of you guys didn't know this was possible. So let's go, uh, let's go through this. So here we go. Here's a mechanical version of a tangential hot tap. Um, and here's the weld on version of a tangential hot tap. Well, how the heck are we gonna do this? Uh, so the weld on version, again, relatively easy. We just weld it. 
because uh, it's carbon steel pipe. So what we're going to do is, and you can see like what is he doing in the center of that flange there? He's uh, pulling the uh, he's, he's pulling the coating. Our welder's pulling the coating off, and what he's going to weld is a triangle there. Uh, so it's going to be flat, and then our pilot's going to hit this. So when our pilot hits it. It's not going at an angle, or otherwise the pilot's going to hit it and it's going to want to go down and snap on us. We don't want our pilot to snap, that causes a whole bunch of problems. So we're going to weld kind of a cheater plate there, so when the pilot hits it, it thinks it's going perpendicular in, and then it'll go through and that pilot's going to carry the cutter along with it. And there you go. Uh, you see that coupon on the left hand side, you see where the, our welder welded the, the nice square to keep it perpendicular. And then that's what the coupon looks like at the end of the day. These are a little more expensive because um, like most of our shell cutters are three and a half to five and a half inches deep. Depending on the size of your tangential hot tap, these can be quite long in order to actually complete that hot tap, especially if you're on HTPE pipe or something like that uh, with thick wall. Uh, they can get quite long, uh, but very doable. Next is mechanical fitting on duct hour fitting. So we cannot do this uh, wet. So for tangential hot taps, we can do it on carbon steel, um, HTPE, PVC, and AC. We cannot do it on ductile iron or cast iron. And that is because we can't weld that cheater plate on the cast iron or ductile iron. And the pilot will hit it and it'll want to walk down and snap on us. Um, so we can't do it on cast or ductile. We might be able to without a pilot, but then we couldn't guarantee that we would retain your coupon. Um, but you can do it uh, dry on ductile iron. And why would you do that? Well, this is class 350 ductile iron. These fittings are rated to 350 PSI. They're hydrostatically tested to 300 and 50 PSI or whatever the test pressure is before we leave site. And they're maybe 25% of the cost of uh, 30 by 8 uh, MJ, MJ by tangential hot tap. So there's a ton of savings here. And I imagine if you have a capital project and you're trying to save some money and it's full of these big expensive ductile iron tangential fittings, uh, you could probably save some decent money uh, by doing it this way. Uh, all right, there's another photo. Engineered hot taps, angled hot taps. So we're often asked, especially on the sewer side of things, sometimes water, but mostly sewer, hey, can you hot tap at an angle for us? And the answer is, uh, yes, we can. Um, again, on everything except ductile iron and cast. Uh, again, because you can't weld that cheater plate. You need the same cheater plate on... Um, you need the same cheater plate on the 45 as you do for tangential hot taps. <clears throat> but here you have it. And uh, again, these can be expensive, uh, not just because it's an engineered fitting, this is a well done version, but also because again, we're going to need deep cutters. So sometimes you're lucky and someone else has already bought a deep cutter, or maybe if you're doing your own hot taps, you have for whatever reason bought a nice deep cutter. Um, but a lot of the time these cutters will have to be manufactured specific for this hot tap if, uh, if they've never been made in the past. And we have lots of 6 and 8s, but as soon as you get up to like an 18 off of 18 at a 45, well, your cutter is going to need to be probably 80, I don't want to guess, but my guess is about 14 to 16 inches to complete that tap. There's a good chance that it'll have to be a custom-made cutter for that project. So it can be a little more expensive. And you need, uh, with that long cut comes a machine, a big machine with a lot of travel uh, to complete that laying length. So a lot of the time what ends up happening is they'll get the price for the 45 inch hot tap or the, even the fitting that's engineered. And they'll say, do you know what? All I need is a eight inch. I'm just gonna upsize it to a 10 or a 12 inch. And then my flow modeling works again. It's gonna be a lot cheaper than doing it at a 45. So lots of guys will just upsize their valve and then uh, reduce after uh, their 45 downstream and then their flow modeling will work. Yes, sir? Questions come in. Uh, tangential or the angled hot tap on PVC? Yes, it can be done, yeah. 
Uh, very slowly and very carefully, but it, uh, it can be done for sure. Yeah, good question. And there's an example of the fitting. Uh, and then um, on the right-hand side, you just see a smaller diameter version, um, which can be a little tricky because it's pretty hard to, uh, those are tricky hot taps because you've got to weld the 45 before uh, you weld the nozzle on because it's so thin. You just got to make sure your, your welder actually knows how to measure and uh, <laughs> uh, do it fairly well because uh, it can be a little harder. And you don't want to, the 45 that you put in there, you don't want it bigger than your cutter because it'll knock all your carbide teeth on. So if it's a little oversized and your carbide teeth go down and it clips the corners, it'll blow all your carbide teeth off and your cut uh, will be very ugly, especially on stainless steel tank like that. All right, large diameter. So my definition of large diameter in this case is very different than other people's idea of large diameter. So this is for large diameter greater than 60 inches. Uh, so for most of you guys, this section won't apply at all. Uh, there might be a few CRD guys, maybe a few Metrovan guys online who this would apply for. Um, or uh, s some of you guys might have like large uh, Sani or large Storm that this will apply for. Uh, but it's worth, worth talking about anyway because we go over some good points. And it's also for brittle size on size. So this would be like a 20 a 16 inch high pressure cast iron size on size or like any cast iron 24 off 24 where you're removing a large section of that piece of pipe, you would uh, want to consider going to some of these fittings. So here's a big one. I don't know exactly. This isn't mine. I took it from uh, our, our manufacturer's website because we haven't done anything this big in town here. Um, but I, I believe this is a... Uh, Ah, it's got to be like a 96 by 48. Um, but uh, what it is, this is essentially the same sleeve you saw for the uh, C301, C303. But what happens is, so you're trying to wrap around this, you know, 96 inch or 114 inch pipe. And your friction losses from trying to wrap around it are just so great. Because you're trying, you can imagine just trying to wrap this steel around that pipe. Uh, that you can't guarantee very good gasket compression. So you're better off actually just doing a big sleeve around it and then having that second piece that you can draw, again we call it a draw flange, that you can draw into the pipe to get good gasket compression. And then you're not getting gasket compression from torque, you're actually getting a measured gasket compression from feeler gauges. And um, that gives you a much more accurate um, impression of the, the gas compression. And again, even if this was a 48 off a 96 um, on ductile iron, but it was only 90 PSI, you might get away with your standard two-piece epoxy coated carbon steel sleeve. This is likely, which is often true for large transmission lines, this is probably, you know, guessing a 96 or 114 inch main, running at like 200 PSI where you really need to make sure you get that good, that good gasket compression. Next, we're looking at a big MJ, MJ style sleeve. Um, if you're on brittle pipe, uh, especially cast iron, if you're on 19, 19, you know, 36 inch cast iron and you need to put a 30 inch hole in it, you're removing so much of that structural integrity of the pipe and then you're compressing exactly where you're removing that structural integrity. Uh, if you go with the MJMJ, MJ, you're really moving where you're compressing that pipe outside of your cut area, and it's now being supported outside of your cut area. It's a really good idea when you're getting into large diameter, especially high pressure where you need a lot of torque on your sleeves uh, to go to these MJMJ MJ style suits. And if it's a really crappy pipe, uh, you can kind of build these to suit, like they'll also use these a lot for emergency repairs on large diameter, uh, steel, cast, AC, anything, and they can span as far as you want. So say you have an eight foot crack, you could actually build this out to, uh, you know, as long as you want. You could even build it to go over your bell and spigots and cover that whole pipe section 
and, and go as far as you want in order to do that. And you can hot tap it or you can get it without the nozzle and just do a big repair clamp. Again, typically on a very large diameter pipe, um, but this is a good option. It's quite expensive. Uh, you'll, you'll only purchase it if you need it, I promise. Um, all right. So again, uh, like I said uh, with this one, this is probably high pressure. If you're lower pressure, if you're, you know, uh, 90 PSI, 60 PSI on a 96 inch line, you can still get away with your two inch. Uh, up to 175, I would think. I'd have to check with engineering. Um, it's really when you're on higher pressure, you'll, you'll want to go with a, with a fitting like this or, or even a fitting like this will work because you can predict where, where that compression is and, and get a good seal there. All right, here's a 24 off 24. Up, yes, sir. Sorry, question. Uh, back to that tangential fitting that you were showing us. Uh, yeah. Uh, where would you typically use those? Uh, for air valves and blowdowns, typically for blowdowns. So um, a lot of the, the smaller municipalities just go vertical off the bottom, but the bigger cities like Metro Vancouver, uh, probably CRD, definitely city of Calgary, uh, the way water moves through your pipe is actually in a spiral. Um, so if you want to really drain down, especially large diameter pipes, you know, 24 inches and larger, uh, in order to, you know, really properly drain it, it's best to have your blowdown going off the bottom tangentially uh, versus um, vertical off the bottom. It, it gets your best drainage. Otherwise, you end up, uh, you know, and I don't, there's people that know a lot more about this than I do, but I believe you end up with just not prop, slower drainage and probably air bubbles and stuff like that uh, as well. Good question. All right, so yeah, here we go, 24 off 24 uh, cast iron pipe uh, on a hot tap like this, I would definitely recommend considering the 414 sleeve. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll, we'll push this as much as we can. There's definitely uh, to a point, whether, whether the city specifies it or not, at some point, if you have us coming to do this hot tap for you, if you don't have your own machine, we'll say, uh, we're just not going to do that. <laughs> and if this, if this was operating at like 250 PSI and the, the municipality said, well, I don't, we don't want to pay, you know, I'm not sure what it costs, $9,000 for that sleeve, we'd say, you know, find someone else to do it because you're getting, it's getting dangerous at that point to, to start doing size on size taps. Not on ductile iron. Ductile iron properties are very different. It's not at all brittle. It's very malleable but cast iron scary. And AC pipe too at some point, uh, we would start looking at either switching to the first one you saw, the 196, 114 inch one with the draw flange or uh, something like this too. It's just, it can be really hard to seal AC with those style glands. We would probably look to that 415 style pipe uh, fitting, uh, the, the draw flange style fitting, sorry. Here you go. Beautiful fittings, though. They look, they look great, really good quality, just quite expensive. Uh, back in the day, actually, most guys probably don't care, but very interesting, these were like the original hot tap fittings. This is how, how all hot taps were done at one point in their big cast iron MJMJ fittings. Mueller used to make them. They still make them, actually, uh, but, but they make them. All right, engineered hot taps, high pressure. So high pressure, specifically high pressure mechanical fittings. High pressure um, uh, weld on fittings, quite simple. Run your M11 cal, I shouldn't say simple, but run your M11 calcs. Uh, we'll go over that in a minute, actually. High pressure mechanical fitting. So how do we do this? Lots of guys don't know this, but if you just switch to an MJL, because we get this all the time. So 150 pound ANSI flanges, which is what's compatible with pretty much every valve on the market, is good to 285 PSI. But everyone's buying class 350 ductile iron, uh, which is good, it's a great product. They're buying class 350 ductile iron and go, I want my design pressure to 350 PSI. Okay, that's fine, but no flanges are actually compatible uh, to, unless you go up to 300 ANSI or a class, uh, class F, flanges aren't compatible. So the easiest and most affordable way to get 
your hot tabbing sleeve up to 350 PSI design for class 350 ductile iron, or like a, you know, I'm, there's some PVC out there that's probably rated to 352. I'm not totally sure actually. Might be pretty thick DR. But um, uh, to get 350, just go MJ by MJ by MJ and you can do it. So you just order your sleeve. It'll have to be an engineered sleeve to get to that pressure rating. But if you get an MJ outlet sleeve with an MJ valve, uh, that's the, for sure the easiest way to achieve that 350 PSI design pressure. It's very rare. I can't think of any time that we've gone to a higher PSI than that without it being carbon steel or HDPE. Um, so that'll cover you know, 95% more. It'll cover 99.9% of uh, your high pressure situations by going MJMJ. The other option, and we'll just run through the, through the different fittings. So standard fittings come with a class D flange. They're all good to 150, uh, 175 PSI. If you're ever ordering material for a line designed higher than 175 PSI, you need to let your manufacturer know uh, that it's above 175 PSI because uh, they're typically not going to stock it. It's typically going to be special order stuff. So how to get up to 285 PSI, it's, it's quite easy. Switch to a Class E or 150-pound ANSI. If you're using stainless steel hardware, uh, you'll also have to potentially, again, I'm not the engineer designing this, but you'll probably have to switch to a hardened stainless as well in order to get to the stainless of the foot-pounds you need it. If you're using alloy nuts and bolts, no problem. Uh, the other way to get to 350 PSI is to switch to a 300 pound ANSI flange, <clears throat> but then you're also switching to a class, 350, uh, class 250 uh, resilient wedge gate valve or uh, you know, um, uh, some sort of a steel wedge uh, gate valve. But then your system's going into the 300 pound class. Um, in my opinion, you're better going MJMJ for most uh, standard water uh, water setups anyway. All right, weld on fittings. So there's a lot of different weld on fittings here, and it's important for you guys to know for the waterworks guys, the top four are the only ones you're ever going to see. So you'll just see a straight flange nozzle. Again, if you're going through a blind or a cap, um, in the mechanical industrial industry, you see that all the time, but they typically have thicker and stronger uh, steel. They're usually running like 3 8 standard wall steel at a minimum. In the water industry, uh, we're running quarter inch and uh, uh, 5 16 stuff all over the place. I'd say most of the water pipes in the ground are quarter inch or, or 5 16. Um, Next, the one to the right of it is a split T, so that's full reinforced. So if you were going 36 off 36, we would, uh, for if you wanted us to hot tab it, we'd say it has to be a full wrap fitting because we want that reinforcing because we're removing so much of the structural integrity of that pipe uh, that we want a full wrapper. Uh, the one to the left is flange nozzle repad. That's the most common branch fitting you're going to see in the uh, waterworks industry, flange nozzle with a reinforcing collar. The one to the left is a two-piece. We use that a lot for um, our line stops. And the reason why we do that, because the one above it, so the one on the top right, you weld the nozzle first, and then you weld the wrapper around it. Um, and what that does is, if your pipe is out around, you just locked it out around by welding that nozzle on there. When the one below it's a two piece, so the body's thick. It's usually like a half inch to three quarters of an inch thick on large diameter stuff. So if we put that on, it doesn't fit. We then have the opportunity to mechanically round that pipe. So whether you're using hydraulics or chains or whatever, depending on pressure and size, you can bring that pipe back and around and then get the fittings on there and weld it. And then those fittings will hold that pipe in around, which when you're launching a, a round line stop in there, you really want it as close to round as you can to avoid that blow by. Uh, so those are often the fittings you'll see. Um, I thought there's something else here. It must be farther on. Um, so let's go to the case study here. So this is a hot, what I would call uh, on the water side, if you talk to the oil and gas guys, they would consider this low pressure. But for water, this is high pressure. So it's a uh, high pressure 42-inch um, line stop. 
And what happens is <clears throat> we're required to have a single valve isolation uh, on these large diameter ones if you're working downstream in a confined space. And engineers will typically only sign off on a single valve isolation for a two to one safety factor. So even this line's running at 210 PSI. Um, our equipment's rated to 250 PSI plus the manufacturer's safety factor, but uh, most engineers will still say, I want a two to one safety factor on the design. So how do we get a two to one safety factor on these heads um, when they're only rated at 250 PSI and the, um, the pressure in the line is between 210 and 230. So we're going to do what we call a step, a pressure step. So you see the way the flow is going, it's going downhill in this situation. So what we're going to do is there's going to be three, 230 PSI and then we're going to load up the chamber between the two heads to 115 PSI and then it's going to be zero on the bottom side of those heads. So what in reality you're doing is putting 215 PSI on each head. And if you were at 300 PSI, you could do three in line. It's getting expensive by the time you put three in line, but you could do three in line and go 300 to 200, 200 to 100, 100 to zero. You can, you can just do this and step it down. <clears throat> and that's how you get your factor of safety. Not to mention you have two different pieces of equipment there, both rated to 250 PSI. It's, 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 a, it's a good way to do it. And then what you do is you do controlled blow off. So <clears throat> you are going to get a little bit of leakage on these line stops just because you're going inside of a pipe that's potentially out around, slightly corroded, maybe has debris at the bottom, some rocks, some sand, whatever. There's going to be a little bit of blow by uh, past it. Usually it's quite low, two to eight gallons a minute. Uh, sometimes you will get 100% seal. Um, but so you just do a controlled blow off of that blow by, uh, which hopefully that makes sense. I'll show you some photos. Here's the fitting. So in this case, that line stop fitting, that's a two piece, which we just talked about. Um, the six inch there, which is our purge equalization point, uh, that's at the end to prove out that it is holding that the blow-by is usable, is workable so the guys can work downstream. And we'll also use it to load the line again at the end to get equalization and get the heads out. Um, so here's the two fittings going in line. And oh, let, let me talk about this because um, there's a lot of, not a lot, there's a few municipalities, uh, specifically two big municipalities in Alberta that have said no more welding on their carbon steel water lines. And that's because you know, people not, not knowing or understanding welding, you know, not necessarily their fault. They call up Joe Blow's welding service and they say, hey, Joe, I got a nozzle. I need a weld to come out and do it tomorrow. And Joe goes, okay. And he comes out, you know, big wire feed, you know, quarter inch bead. He's probably not doing a quarter inch bead. But anyway, just blows it on there as best he can. He takes off. Not understanding that this water pipe is often cheap crap. It's often super thin and it's got live water running behind it, like super cooling his welds. And then to mention, there's a high carbon in the pipe as well. So what is carbon? Maybe you've heard of carbon cracking before. So that's what happens. They weld it on. He go, it looks good, looks great, takes off. Well, it's still cooling, 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 cooling. Overnight, it keeps cooling and cracks. And then we come in the morning, put air on it, and air is blowing out of these things everywhere. Thank goodness we test it first. But we don't always test it the next day. Sometimes we test it 15 minutes later uh, when it wouldn't be cracked yet. So you need to make sure you actually have CSA Z66219 in service weld procedure. You need to make sure that you account for the rapid cooling. You need to make sure you account for the high carbon that's potentially uh, in these old water lines. It's very important. Um, otherwise, you're going to get crap welds. And, and uh, it's like my grade 12 teacher used to always tell me, uh, garbage in, garbage out. So, uh, all right. Yes, sir. Oh, five minutes. Okay, let's blast through this here. We're going to go through the welding process, uh, welding on some dogs, get it nice and round, chains, get it round. So at this point, we can tell it's a great fit. This fitting is round, the pipe is round. 
Uh, we're going to dry run our completion plugs. I shouldn't tell you all our secrets. But we, we run these completion plugs beforehand because we want to get the exact measurements. We want to know the plugs are the right size. We want to know they fit before we put the hole in the 210 PSI line. It's really hard to get a plug in there when it doesn't fit after you put the hole in it. So we're going to dry run it, make sure it all works, all looks good. Hot tap it. And then uh, we're going to move all this equipment over there. Uh, put it in line. And if you can see that blue thing there, that's our pressure relief valve. So we set that to the 110 or 115 PSI to do equal pressure zones. And it'll just blow off water to keep that zone equal. We also, while people are working in the confined space downstream, 20, uh, you know, full-time monitoring while people are in confined space, just to make sure if the pressure relief valve malfunctions or whatever, uh, there's a secondary blow off that can be manually controlled. And then, um, do I show it? Uh, I, there's no good photo of it here. Maybe there is farther in. But there's also a four inch and a 16 inch blow off off the can that we could utilize if we need to. Hopefully we don't need to. Something's gone really wrong if we're utilizing a 16 inch blow off. Uh, but it is there if you need it. Uh, and here's your presser jump. So we got the one sitting at 95 and the other sitting at, at 210. And uh, so the, the pressure relief valve should monitor that for us, but we also have a guy checking at uh, 10 minute increments as well while guys are uh, in the confined space. Oh, and here, here it is here. So uh, there's your four inch. So essentially we have a 24 to 16 reducer with a knife gate, and then we have a 16 to four inch reducer. And we just do that uh, just in case it's good to have options. We've never had to use it before, hopefully never will, but uh, there are options there. And the four inch does get used because uh, for, equali for equalizing a 42 inch line, doing that through a two inch blow off is not fast. Uh, so you want that four inch uh, for the equalizing process. All right, I'm down to five minutes. There's the completed one and uh, one more here. I actually made it through, perfect timing. So what happens when you put it all together? Uh, this is one we just designed, um, and what is this? This is a 30 off of 72 tangential reinforced concrete cylinder, no valve hot tap. And I'm hoping uh, this one actually goes next year. I'm pretty excited about it. You guys probably don't care, but I'm excited. Uh, that's a really cool hot tap. I don't know uh, if this has ever been done in Western Canada before. So, Cool, cool. Thanks, guys. It's been a pleasure. Hopefully... Uh, Hopefully you learned something. All right. Cool, cool. Any questions at the end here? Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Brandon. That was great. So one of, the, one of the questions was about qualifications. You've touched on that for welding. Uh, so you guys obviously have qualifications to do this. How do you get you know, qualified, certified, where you do your training for your guys, that kind of thing? Yeah, so we would actually love it if there was a... Um, like a skilled trade for this um, because it would <laughs> stop Joe Blow from grabbing his pickup truck and competing with us. Um, but honestly, like we've been around since 1980 and we have a internal training program. And uh, so that, that is how it's done. But there is like TD Williamson does have uh, some external training and some of our guys originally were going through that, but it's really, uh, typically specific to the oil and gas industry, which is where most high pressure um, and, and dangerous hot taps are done. Uh, so there isn't like a pre-qualification process. I would definitely though, if you're taking on some of those bigger hot taps, um, definitely some of the higher pressure, anything kind of engineered, I would definitely be asking your contractor for a bio and references for sure. And, and that'll be your best option. And if you're really concerned about it, uh, ask for a key personnel, uh, ask for a key personnel um, resume as well. Yeah. yeah I don't think it's like a bias. It looks like some of the stuff could be quite dangerous. And you know, as you said, I don't want Joe Blow doing it. And uh, now you yep. have a WCB claim on your hand. Yeah. And uh, two, if you are doing a lot of PVC hot taps and you're unfamiliar with like best practices, for PVC in your municipality, feel free to give us a call. We like I do offer uh, 
at, in the winter mostly when we're a little slower, I'll come out and do like uh, training on uh, like saddle tapping and best practices for PVC. PVC is uh, the more dangerous of them just because if you don't know the best practices, you can be putting yourself uh, up for some risk for sure. Cool. Great. Okay, I just wanted to, uh, on behalf of EOCP, thank Brandon for a great presentation. Uh, I really appreciate it. And you've got a 15-minute break till the next session. Thanks very much. Awesome. Thank you.